So this week on Say Days TV, we brought a guest on to talk about his love for extremely tight and really, really cool builds. We're also going to talk about Flight Simulator, some of the issues you might come into when you're hopping into that, as well as a check-in on Team Say Days and their recent success in the PUBG Master League. All this and more this week on Say Days TV. What's up guys? So this week we decided to call on a favor from one of our favorite builders in the area, Mike. Uh, Mike works within the industry and as a passion and pastime, he also builds PCs from like monstrous builds to this tight little compact build that we're gonna take a look at today. So first off, Mike, thanks for joining us this week. Uh, before we dive into this really awesome looking build that you have here for us, let's get to know you a little bit. What really fuels your passion and your creativity as far as making these builds? To be honest, uh, I started out as a car guy. Uh, if, with anything, you know, I grew up with my dad building cars and stuff like that. And then uh, that kind of just transitioned to, into computers, you know, being able to build them, see how they run, see how they work. You know, it's really not that hard of a transition for me and, you know, being able to see the performance that I can gain out of this, it's, it's just like building a car with my dad, right? Um, so this has just become a passion just by chance. It's really how it just kind of fell into it and it's been my thing for the last few years, yeah. I can totally understand that because from a streaming perspective where I'm at, that's kind of how I, I fell into computers as well. Just from the production side of things and needing to know more and more about technology, it, it pushed me into that. And uh, again, one of the comparisons I use for people all the time is that building PCs is a lot like building a car. So yeah, I can totally understand that. That's cool. So you've brought us a beast of a machine here in a compact little package. Uh, why don't you lay out some of the specs for us? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's obviously the NZXT H1 case. Um, it comes water cooled and it comes with a 650 watt gold power supply in it already. That, that's why you pay such a premium ice pr uh, price tag for it. Uh, it's got a 9900K in it. Uh, Intel obviously uh, clocked at 5.2 gigahertz. It's got um, 32 gigs of RAM at 3800 megahertz. It's got a GTX or an RTX 2080 Ti. Sorry. Um, yeah, it's got two two terabyte Western Digital Black NVMe SSDs in it, and uh, I mean, that's pretty much it. It's it's so compact, and there's really not much else you could put in there, right? I mean, um, yeah, that's understandable. But even from what you just listed there, I can tell it's packing a serious punch all the way from you know computing power and obviously the graphics power in there with the new RTX. And you said it was the TI? Yeah. It's the 2080 TI. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And right up to the storage, two terabytes of storage in yeah, there? So it was, technically, it's four. Four it's, terabytes it's of dual, storage. It's dual two terabytes. Okay, sorry, I misheard you there. So, yeah, no problem. Yeah, that's insane. The amount that you've been able to pack into really, like, what is not much bigger than a shoebox here <laughs> yeah. is is astonishing. So, I, I, I feel like you haven't really pulled any punches. No, I really haven't. That's great. That's great. All right, so let's talk about real world performance. What can we expect in terms of frame rate from this machine at, let's say, a standard 2K? Well, it depends on the game, really. Um, I play a lot of COD, yep. so, and I play a lot of uh, like hardcore team deathmatch. So for me, uh, the frames in 2K on Ultra with ray tracing on, I'm like my monitor at home is 165 hertz uh, 2K with G-Sync, and I usually hit 165 hertz all day long. I'll dip sometimes down to like 134, 133 but 165 hertz all day long. Um, now with that being said, there are games out there like Ark, we can use that as an example. Uh, 2K, that game was not optimized for 2K, so I get 78 to like 110, depending on what map I'm playing on. Okay. Um, so it, it really depends on the game, the genre, and to be honest, it depends on the optimization of whatever game you're playing, right? Uh, Overwatch, I mean, <laughs> I could use 10% of my GPU and still get 165 frames. You know, uh, when I when I yeah. when I uh, turn off the frame lock on it, I, I get 266 frames in 2K, um, which is just insane. But, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, she's she's definitely built to perform. Um, it's real world. It's, it's it works really well. <laughs> that's the best thing I could say. I mean, yeah, that more than answers my questions about it as far as that goes. Uh, it's extremely impressive numbers too for again. I don't know if the size is being conveyed here, but like, it's like a shoebox. It's it's insane. 
which actually moves me right along to our next point, which is heat. I mean, building in something like this, not only the knowledge about airflow and how to build something like that is, it's got to be extensive, but just maintaining the, not just low levels, but <laughs> at a bare minimum, functional levels of, of, of heat and temperatures in this machine. I mean, I'm sure that wasn't easy. So yeah. how, how'd you go about that? See, um, if, if I, how do I put this? I I came into this thinking I wanted a small machine. I got tired of having the big clunky machines on my desk. Um, I have had a couple other mini ITX builds in, in my lineup of, of the builds I've done. Um, and I came into a couple issues with each and every one. They all have their own caveats where, you know, you run into a wall here, you run into a wall there. Um, I can use an example as the Inwin A1. Uh, I had that one for a very long time. I did a custom water cool loop in it, uh, full hard, hard piping in it and it took me almost three months to build. Um, realized very quickly that with just the two intake fans underneath and the one the one exhaust and the one rear exhaust, I was getting horrible temps and it didn't matter what I did, what kind of uh, fluids I used, everything. It, it just, I was getting horrible temperatures. So I got rid of that. I was kind of nervous getting into this one, but it, I looked into it and I was like, this thing seems like it's got, you know, good cooling. It's got great venting on all three sides. The tempered glass. Um, Temper glass is actually a downfall with this case. Um, temper glass actually holds heat. It retains heat very well. Um, mm -hmm. So the temperatures I see on average now, I have to give Cryonaut due like as much respect as possible. Uh, I went with Cryonaut. I did not want to use their uh, stock thermal paste on this. So I used the Cryonaut stuff and I did drop 20 degrees. Wow. Um, yeah, so and that's I mean, huge. It is water cooled. Um, now with my GPU on the other hand, because of the tempered glass. So if I'm running with my tempered glass and I'm beating the hell out of it, um, I get about 82 degrees okay. Celsius. Um, now with that being said, I pull the front tempered glass off, I drop 10 degrees easily. I'm 72. Um, now they're still well within its thermal limits um, and I'm not getting any thermal throttling or anything like that. I, I also run an Aorus Extreme uh, okay. 2080 Ti, so they're known to be a hot card. Yeah. Um, I did have a Strix 2080 Ti in it at one point, and I was running between 68 and 72 with the with the glass on. Um, so I have noticed a difference going to the Aorus, but I wanted that extra power, I wanted that extra jam, and I really like the lighting that happens when it's when it's under load. So fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, I saw it lit up earlier. It really, really does look awesome. I'm sure we probably have some shots of that, but. Uh... I mean, that's just fascinating. I know you were mentioning uh, with the tempered glass, how much it retains heat. I have one of those, you know, just for looks, all tempered glass cases. And I can definitely say that no matter like what I'm really doing on the, on, on the PC, the side temper panel always seems to heat up no matter what. So it really does retain that heat, like you were saying. And I could, I can understand how that would be a, uh, a speed bump, so to speak, coming across the build. Absolutely, and and another thing with these is, is because it's such a weird shape, like it's it's a cube, but it's not a cube. Yeah. Um, it's actually passively cooling itself, so like it does have one fan on the one side, so it is it is pulling air through, um, but it, it, it sucks air from both of these sides here, right? Yep. So you, you can't see it, but on the back, there's another uh, mesh panel here. Um, so in a case like yours, you would have your three fans, a front or two, depending on what case you have, and they're pushing air through your case, and then you have exhaust and exhaust, right? So yeah. that gives you a positive airflow. I don't have that here. Yeah. Uh, and I don't really have the option. Now, under load, my CPU hits 56 degrees under a full load, and that's at 100% load. That's on 8 to 64. That's crazy. Um, yeah, so it's, the Cryonaut has done wonders, and that, that's just something you have to think about when you're building in something small like this, is what little tricks, what little gizmos, what can I do to bring my temps down? Because mm -hmm. you know, if you if you just to slap it together, one of the one of the things you're gonna understand real quickly is, well, shit. Now I'm super super overheated. What, yeah. what can I do? Um, unfortunately, in the N1A1, I didn't have the capability of, of doing some of the stuff I did there. I wasn't in the same position I am today, um, and I've learned a lot coming through here in Mini ITX. <sighs> Don't be afraid to do it, man. Like the. They work. <laughs> they work for really sure. Well, yeah. For sure. And I mean, going into it, I would guess that that would be people's biggest reservation, or at least should be people's biggest reservation, is uh, just mastering like the airflow of it and keeping the temps down in the machine. So, I mean, you heard it here first. You can definitely, definitely do that. If this is something that you're thinking of, you're kind of on the fence with a, 
with a small form micro ATX build like that, don't don't hesitate. You can you can do your research. You can figure it out. You can try different configurations and get that airflow going. Get something super super powerful in a very small form factor. Uh, if they don't mind me adding something onto that. No, um, not at all. He's a hundred percent right. The one the one thing you have to understand, you paid for small. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> you can buy cases all day long and uh, ATX, EATX, all that stuff, and full size cases. You, there are expensive ones on the market, clearly, but you know, your average case, 90, 100 bucks. Yep. You know, um, this guy here is 500 bucks, just the case. That's insane. Um, so it, it does it does cost to be small. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you pay for the convenience, right? That's right. So That's right. Makes sense. Makes sense. Just a few follow-up questions for you here, Mike. Uh, what was your favorite GPU or generation of GPU? Out of curiosity. Um, I mean, it's easy to say like the RTX, but uh, to be yeah, honest, yeah. To be honest, um, as far as like uh, the physical hardware, to be honest, it was uh, the 7990 would actually be my favorite. Um, it was an ATI card, heard uh, whatever. Um, it was two cards in one, and you didn't really see that very often, right? Uh, they came out, the 6990 and the 7990 came out, they were one generation apart. They were, they were dual cards on one board, it was phenomenal. Um, that's actually kind of, when I first got into it, those were like the cards to, to get. Um, and then you got 690 was the same thing. Uh, I believe that was two, I could be wrong, but I believe it was two 670s on one board. Um, and yeah, like... That was probably my favorite generation, seeing companies come out and be like, well, you know what? Here, we're going to sandwich these together and hand them to you. You know what I mean? It was kind of like, well, this is really cool. Now I don't have to run Crossfire or SLI or anything like that. It's, it's two cards. And you can physically go into the system and, and disable one. So if a game doesn't didn't um, like work well with Crossfire or uh, SLI, for example, mm -hmm. you could go in and just be like, okay, turn one card off, and it would still run mint. And uh, yeah, that was that was probably my favorite time. Yeah, back then was the, that's, a, that's my favorite GPUs for sure. That's cool. I I feel like a lot of people would have a very like not similar response as far as the card that they pick, but in the terms that when they came into CPU or sorry PC building, when they came into PC building, um, the things that were really making a splash on the market at that time kind of resonates with them forever. You know what I mean? Yeah, I would say so too. For sure. So, I mean, now that we're talking about GPUs, moving right to our next question. This is an NVIDIA build, mm -hmm. but was there ever a time where NVIDIA wasn't your go-to, where you felt that AMD was more the king of the GPU sector? Absolutely. So I can answer this one very easy and very honestly. Um, so I used to be a part of a very big gaming community uh, when I first I wouldn't say when I first got in, but it was when I first got like really into computers, um, really into building my own, I should say. Um, I had a 6950, and that was a, that was a AMD ATI, whatever. Um, and I was into the, a massive Battlefield 3 clan, and we were huge. And I just remember the guys like, oh, I got this card, I got that card, I got this card, and I'm just going like, what card do I get? You know, at yeah, this time yeah. I didn't really know. And I had started with like a, a five series. I can't remember what it was. And then uh, I got into the 6950 and I got the 6990. And I remember just feeling like, you know, you know like just the best guy in the world. I was like, this I have the best computer ever. Um, and that was on a 2600K, believe it or not. So, you know, that's, that's it, you're going back a few years. <laughs> yeah, and, for uh, sure. I, I went from that to a 7990, and I'll never forget coming home. I went to the computer store and uh, I bought it. I, I believe it was NCIX at the time, and uh, I came home, and then, you know, I'm like, "Oh man, this thing's gonna be amazing." Plug it in, and it didn't work. I'm like, "Oh no, what, what oh, happened?" No. You know, and I was I was all upset, <laughs> only to realize that because it was a dual card, the power draw on it was so intense that my my little crappy OCZ power supply just couldn't handle it. You know. <laughs> So uh, I went out and I bought my first big boy power supply, which is a thousand watt uh, Corsair, and uh, plugged it in. And it, as soon as it lit up, and it was always Sapphire. Uh, you know, for AMD, I've always been a Sapphire fan. I thought okay. I feel like they make the best cards. And uh, yeah, the hardware and just everything worked, and it was just glorious. And that, hands down, I was an AMD guy from, from that point on. Um, 
until I wasn't. <laughs> uh, not they don't make bad stuff at all. Um, it's just you know I started uh, I started dabbling in uh, Nvidia at the 690. I had a 680 classified 690, um, and then yeah I, I just kind of I held onto the 690. It kept me through right up through to uh, the 9 series, and then I had a 9 what a 980 Ti, and then 1080 Ti, and so on and so forth, and. I've kind of gotten into that whole mentality of I have to have the best cards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just being in the industry, it kind of gives me that opportunity to do that. For sure, for sure. And that's, I mean, like you said, being into the industry gives you the opportunity to do that. Being in that position must be so cool to uh, always, um, you know, be lined up for like the cutting edge stuff. And not just that, but also have the knowledge about, you know, what you should be putting in your mas machine and what is going to be top of the line in that regard. Well, and, and that's kind of where I, I, I'm kind of a little bit luckier than other people. Uh, at least I consider myself luckier than other people. Uh, like we had spoken about earlier, um, I've built quite a few machines this year alone, just personally. And so I get to play with, I've played with every iteration of Ryzen and every iteration of Intel. Um, I don't really touch the AMD cards now. I did have a Red Devil for very, a very brief time, a 5700 XT. Um, and it wasn't a bad card, it just wasn't a 2080 Ti. Um, and I'm not knocking any companies. I think everybody's out there trying to do their thing right now, and, and the competition's amazing. And uh, for sure, yeah. for sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's an exciting time to be in the industry for sure. Well, yeah, that's such an awesome perspective because um, I've only built like a couple PCs, and I have done one AMD build. But even going into any of those builds, you pretty much just watch and read reviews as much as you can to get a good idea. You know, get the numbers back and everything like that. But as far as like your preference you don't really get to feel that out as a pc builder from the consumer side of things because you i mean and i've always kind of thought this everybody speaks on their preference but at the end of the day that's biased by what you picked right and what you've been running and it must it, it must just be so valuable i guess as a builder to to be in the position you are to be able to have so many builds and like you said play with so many different um, companies and parts and all of that and really really I guess hone your preferences for parts so yeah yeah I've, I've been I've been very fortunate in the fact that like I've owned um, to date all of the Ryzen processors that have been available that's and crazy I've owned all the Intel ones except for 10th gen I'm just stepping into that for I will be stepping into that in my next build um, so I've kind of capped at the 9th gen for for Intel but um, that's cool be, being able to like touch them see how they work see how they run see the the overclocking capabilities of them and and seeing like the overhead the underhead everything anything that you can do with them i've been able i've been fortunate enough to do that um and you know i'm thankful for it i mean this is an industry that's that's you know never gonna go away yeah you know? definitely and, and it's getting bigger every single day yeah and i mean the gaming what's what i like i'm not a young buck you know um and, 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 <laughs> and seeing pc gaming a thing now is actually exciting you know seeing i have kids that come into my sh my shop and you know and and they may not be buying the greatest thing they don't have all the money that you know if they're not able to afford something like this but they come in for sure and they're buying their first computer for like 1500 bucks canadian which you know isn't a whole lot um <laughs> and they Pennies, you know? and, yeah, yeah <laughs> and they do that and they're so excited and i just for me that that reinvigorates me that makes me like you know i was that kid at one point you know what i mean for me growing up, PC gaming wasn't a thing. It was always console gaming. You know, yep. I had Nintendos, I had Genesis, I had all that stuff. So it was a transition into this, and now that I'm a PC gamer, I'll never go back. And, and seeing these kids get excited about the same thing I'm excited about, I think that's amazing. That's really cool. I, I'm kind of jealous of your job. It sounds like uh, it really gives you such an interesting perspective on the industry and, again, lines you up in so many valuable positions to really, like carve out those opinions and those preferences and not just from a performance standpoint but i remember you mentioning earlier even like things like rgb from you know an aesthetic standpoint mm -hmm. so how do you feel about rgb i guess since i brought that up <laughs> everybody likes to know those opinions all so. right so i think rgb is essential but non-essential <laughs> um i think some people will overdo it um i've i've built a few computers where just everything had to light up as you can see on this thing, there's really no RGB. I even turned the RGB off on the board. I only run... If that's you out there, pay attention right yeah. now. If you're overdoing RGB, even if you think you might be, 
Listen up, kid. Yeah, um, RGB can be overdone. I mean, I've always, I've always thought RGB is is an accent. You know, um, it's it's to highlight the parts that you want to highlight, and that's it. I mean, that's my personal preference. Um, so, I, mean, I would have got, to agree. You've got guys out there. Um, and then there's so many different RGB products. You've got you know RGB on everything now. You even have these things called strimmers, which are um, the eight pin and the twenty four pin that go on your motherboard. Um, it's a full. 240 LED lights all the way through those things, so you can set them up to go crazy, and it's just it's insane. And uh, they definitely run the market. I was trying to explain this to my dad, which it was kind of hard. Um, I was looking at some liquid coolers and some without RGB, some with RGB, and explaining to him that it's actually more expensive to get the ones without RGB now because they there's just less of them, and yeah. the companies are running. The standard is to run the RGB manufacturing for everything. Everything has a rainbow on it, and he was he couldn't wrap his brain around it. You know, coming coming from <laughs> from back in his time and everything. He's yeah. so you pay less for the shiny lights. I'm like, yeah, because it's it's the standard now, really, which well, is crazy. And it's funny you say that because you're right. Um, so you can get there are companies out there that you know um, even Fractal for example uh, Fractal is one of my favorite case companies NZXT is my favorite if I have to say yeah um, and uh, Fractal uh, I've owned a lot of their mesh of ICs I've built in that case 14 times so I'm always looking for different iterations on how can I build in this right and they have their um, it's a Celsius series uh, coolers and they actually just added a new little ring. Um, it is the first time RGB's ever been in them. They have like Prisma fans, which are really nice. Um, but that they're still like their price point, still like 170 bucks in around there, and they're fantastic. And they, I mean, they're really innovative the way they do their things. But RGB on coolers, I don't think is as important nowadays as companies like NZXT. Um, they've come out with their uh, Z series coolers that now have a little screen, a little LED screen on With them. the LED screen on it, I've seen that yeah. and I've seen that utilized in actually really creative ways all the way down to content creators using it as branding in yeah. their video. They'll throw their logo on their build in the background, which d coming again from my perspective, I'm like, that's genius, yeah, you yeah, know what really I mean? Cool. That's, so, that's so smart, yeah. so. Yeah, again, just like the innovation around parts and the design side of the industry. I think people forget how much that can push things forward. Just aesthetic look and feel of your build can really, really push innovation and bring us some cool things. Like you said, a screen on your CPU cooler, so. Yeah, what's cool about that too, though, like RGB screens, all that stuff, it all dictates personality. It's, it's all... You put yourself into your computer, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about it. You know, like, I built this very, very simple looking, but powerful. That's what I wanted. I wanted yeah. a small, compact, powerful machine, and just, you know, I didn't want a whole lot of lights around it. Um, I have <laughs> enough of that with, like, my microphone and my everything else. Um, with that being said, though, you know, little Timmy might come out and be like, well, I want LED strips, and I, you know, fur balls hanging, and if that's what he wants, you know what I mean? Like that's that's the beauty about PC building. You know, there's so many different companies out there doing so many different things that you can make a personal PC yours, and that's all that matters. As long as you look at it every day and you say, "I built that," good for you, man. One hundred percent. And I think what some people might forget is that something like this kind of build, minimalist as it may be, can pack a lot of personality. If you take this build or the you know little Timmy build that you were just talking about with the pom poms and the lights and you put them both in the same room in a hallway, you know, identical rooms, and you walk down that room, or down that hallway, sorry, and you look through those doors, you're gonna know whose room is whose, just by seeing the PC. And the fact that that can become, you know, it's the same thing as like the covers you have on your bed or the pictures you have on your wall. The personality of your build can really sync up with the rest of your life and set it apart from other people's builds and other people's interests. And I, you make a great point on that. I really value that and I really appreciate that. So we touched on NVIDIA versus AMD GPUs there. I guess it's only fair to ask you Ryzen or Intel? What's mm. your opinion on that one? Who's running the market right now? Uh, Ryzen's running the market right now, actually. Um, Ryzen has done what most companies aspire to do and they've come out swinging hard. Um, they were AMD, 
they, even with their FX series and stuff like that, they just they were weren't there. Like they, Intel just had had the corner market or the market cornered, sorry, and they were just running train on everybody. And now, you know, Ryzen is just everywhere. You know what I mean? Everywhere you look, they they're in your face. Their marketing campaign is phenomenal. Everything they do is phenomenal right now. Um, if I had to pick, still I'm still in. A, I'm, I'm Team Blue, um, and I can explain why. Um, and I don't, I don't make any excuses for any company. Um, so Ryzen, if you are a multitasker, and I'm not saying like you can't multitask on Intel, but what I'm saying is if you're a heavy, heavy multitasker, if you're doing, you know, AutoCAD, um, if you're doing anything that's just processor heavy and processor intense, um, and gaming is not your number one priority, go Ryzen. I mean, you, you can't beat the cores, um, and you can't beat the, the the capability of those processors um, but if you're just if you're a gamer and you want max frames and you want the most potential out of your system as far as gaming goes it's Intel still to this day um, so I mean I hate to say it but there's there's some of the mid-level like the uh, Steve from gamers Nexus he just he just uh, said that the i5 9400k or 9, 9600k sorry uh, and the 9400f were actually rated as the best gaming processors right now to today's standards wow now obviously if you're streaming you're going to need more cores and yes you can stream on an i5 i proved that uh, you can stream on an i7 um just not well <laughs> so um the 9700k actually streamed very well uh, i did that for many years uh, well, not a year, I should say. I shouldn't say many years. I don't own stuff that long. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the 9900K has proven to be a very, very solid streamer. But I mean, like, for the amount of money people put into their computers nowadays, and, and if you're serious about streaming, um, and you want it, you want max graphics, max frames in your games, but you don't want to put too much strain on your computer. I mean, that's where Elgato comes in. You know, Elgato makes a huge difference. Um, so. Realistically, it's, it's all preference. I mean, I know for a fact that when I had my 3950X and my 3900X from Ryzen, uh, they ran stupid hot, but I could do things with those uh, in AutoCAD, Tinkercad, because I have a 3D printer as well. And uh, I do a lot of, and you know, like I said, I, I have access to a machine shop. So that yep. kind of stuff there, like when I'm doing CAD and when I'm doing stuff like that, like my 9900K would chug, whereas my Ryzen was amazing. Like I could just throw things around left, right, center. Uh, the multitasking on those things is insane as well. And, I mean, Gen 4, PCI, SSDs. I mean, that's <laughs> <come> on now. <laughs> um, so, like, Ryzen definitely has its, has its pluses, but they both come with their own caveats, right? Like, um, Ryzen runs, you know, warmer than, than most. Um, Gaming-wise, they're... They don't have the single core performance that most games require, uh, or, or demand, I should say. Um, but are they still capable? 100%. Like yeah. 100%. Um, now, Intel, on the other hand, Intel, I've got my own, I've got my own qualms with them. Um, I, I, I really, really enjoy the speed of my Intel. Like 5.2 gigahertz, it's, it's incredible. It's fast. Um, but it comes with those trade-offs too, right? Like uh, AutoCAD. No, <laughs> you know what I mean. Like it works, but not uh, not to the standards that Ryzen does. So I mean, like it's a fifty-fifty shot. To be honest, uh, I think they have their own applications, and yeah. you know, given given the applications you're using those for, you know, that's how you pick and choose. And I think they they both have their niches, and they're really good at both of their niches. And honestly, I think we're in a perfect place in the industry as far as that that goes. I think that's kind of what you want as far as competition goes in an industry like this, almost like a Venn diagram, right? Where there, there are a certain series that are head-to-head -head competing, but at the same time, both both companies have their specialties and their use cases that can really create a proper divide between consumers, you know what I mean? That doesn't just come down to opinion or doesn't come down to a constant flip-flop, back and forth, Coke, Pepsi kind of argument, you know what I mean? Where there really is substantial reason to either pick one or the other, and at the same time, they keep fighting to be the best. Well, I mean, and, that, and that's, they, they complement each other too, and, and I think it's, it's kind of funny how, you know, Intel, and I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus here, but uh, between the 2700K all the way up through to the 7700K, there was, there was a nominal increase 
in performance over the years and there was really no reason to go if you had a 2700k there was really no reason for you to upgrade yeah. at all then the 8700k came out and that was only because Ryzen was on the horizon, so to speak. <laughs> Pushed you know, out and, those, and, uh, yeah, and, and so those closeted builds, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, you know, they exactly. had them in the back storage or yeah, something. They had to bring them out. So until was like, oh damn, we need to do something. Yeah, because Ryzen has all these claims, seven nanometer and this and that. And so they they did it, and and you know now there's competition. Now there's actual tangible reasons why they have to upgrade so it gives you that like oh wow 10 k what's this gonna do over you know the 3950x oh, like yeah so, and it's it's awesome it's it's cool to see and oh 100 the, the industry is really yeah it, it, it's it's all up in the air right now it's, it's great it's exciting to be a consumer yeah yeah for sure i mean they need to bring their prices down let's be, let's, <laughs> let's be honest <laughs> but yes yeah we need yeah, we need a we need a third contender to enter the fray and and you know bring down the prices Yes, yes we do. Someone, yes. please. Moving right along, I guess to, to, to close things up, the last thing I'd like to ask you is, do you have any advice for aspiring builders, young or old, just someone just getting into this kind of, not even necessarily smaller form builds, but any type of building, any advice? Yeah, absolutely, uh, take the leap. I mean, a lot of people, uh, at least a lot of people that I deal with on a daily, um, people are just, they're, they're worried. They're worried that they're going to spend, you know, upwards of $2,000 on their first build. And what can they get more than, say, a PS4 or an Xbox One? Um, and, and my advice is, you know, do it. I mean... Just do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard for me to put in words what you're going to experience when dealing with a computer. I mean, obviously there's ups and downs, and a lot of people see computers as just a means to an end or like emails and stuff like that. But there's so much more, and like the fidelity on PC versus any console, it's it's night and day. Yeah. Um, just the options you have in your games. If, if you're anything like me, um, I actually really enjoy frame. I'm a bit of a frame snob. I have to have high frames, but I fair, really, fair. I really, really enjoy like the looks of my games. So like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, for example, that is a phenomenal game for me to use as an example because it's gorgeous. Um, I have a 2K monitor, like I said. Um, I run this thing, and you know, I have it on my Xbox One and my One X, and uh, I have it on PC as well. And night and day difference. It's but, you know, Xbox One X, I'm getting a solid 60 frames all the way through, whereas you will get dips on PCs, depending on your on your parts, and you really kind of do your homework. <laughs> that's that's another thing, yeah, do Ooh, your homework. That's a, that's a very good tip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's uh, just going in and, and, you know, throwing parts at, the, at a computer all willy-nilly, it's just gonna, you're gonna end up with a really bad experience at the end of the day. Um, now, ask as many questions as you need. And uh, I mean, if you ever come into my store, you're more than welcome to ask me a bunch of questions. I'm, I'm always happy to help. Um, the reality is, is that there's there's good there is good advice and bad advice, just like anything in life. Yeah. Um, but the best stuff I can tell you is, is is do your research. There's a lot of really great channels on 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 YouTube there that you can you know listen to. But at the end of the day, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, those channels are wonderful one. And at the end of the day, it's it's really like do what you want. Like, don't let anybody else dictate what you're gonna buy or what you're gonna, you know, do with your computer. If you want to go and you want to drop fifteen hundred bucks on a, or an entry level computer, that's fine. If you want to go and just drop do six thousand dollars, yeah, just do absolutely. it. Absolutely. And at the end of the day, hey, this is gonna last you longer than your console will anyway. You know what I mean? It's um, and you can do more. Can flex on all your console friends too. Exactly, and I mean now everything's going cross console too. So you can be a dweeb, sit in front of your 60-inch TV, and or you can sit in front of your 27-inch monitor in like the highest fidelity possible, <laughs> and just be like, "Whoa, PC Master Race!" I mean, join us. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> you know? Well, Mike, thank you very much for coming out this week and uh, giving us giving us the lowdown on this build and giving us some very, very valuable insight from a very interesting place in the industry. Uh, I had a great time talking about the building. I actually learned a lot from you, so thank you very much, man. Anytime. Thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure.
On to Team Sadays. The boys were at it yet again during the PUBG Master League Summer Event where they pushed their way to a second place win over the other contenders. Beating out Norse Wolf, Team Curson, and Dream BH Gaming, clocking in 207 kills and 358 points, this puts them in the top two, which takes them on to the next event with a chance to take them into an even bigger prize pool. We'll have updates for you as they come. In the meantime, here's some highlights of the event leading up to their breakthrough performance. A Gulang Ichi DBH Lamin Chen. Now so Flight Simulator 2020 is finally out, and this release was met with raving reviews from fans old and new alike, offering playability for not only, you know, the amateur or novice flight simulator people, but also the very, very experienced and quote-unquote pro flight simulator fans. All right, well, that's enough talking about it. You guys know I don't like discussing games half as much as I like playing them, so let's head up to the office and get into some FS 2020. Oh! <laughs> this, I'm going to LA. It's a flight I've done before. Feels comfortable. Let's fly. I feel like I need to be telling you like believe, achieve, aspire. Don't let your dreams be your dreams. Raise your throttle now. And once that ends, you'll see it when it starts to catch and you'll start moving once you There you go, there you go. Keep her left. We're ignoring you. We're doing... Oh, it worked. So this week we got to check out a really clean build, hang out with Mike and talk a bunch of tech, as well as hop into the Microsoft Flight Simulator and see what all the hype surrounding that was about. If you guys haven't done so already, hop on your socials, give us a follow on Facebook and Instagram, Check out BTS content and keep up to date on all the newest Say Days peripherals. I'm Matt, and as always, this has been Say Days TV, growing together with gamers. We'll see you guys next week. Did, did, did he leave this here? Did we just get a free uh, computer? I, I ruined your did take. We just, did we just get a free computer?